Ons het um, vir Brian Holly so, en dan is het vir Madeleine, <laughs> hier so, voor op die verhoog. Vir een specifieke rede gevra om vir oomlik hier te kom staan, en dit is gaan oor die Mission Convention. Um, both of them were there this, this year in March, and um, she was an exhibitor at the Mission Convention, and he was an attendee, is that right? A visitor, yes. He was a visitor and she was an exhibitor, right. He can write the music, I'll write the, the lyrics, what do you call it? <laughs> right, so um, Brian, I just want you to tell us what experience that you had as a visitor at the Mission Convention. Well, when I got the adver advertisement which came through our church, which was Pine Town Church in Durban, I thought this is wonderful, uh, I'm going to sign up for this because... Uh, God had called me on mission in terms of public evangelism, but not on in terms of being on the front lines. So I thought, well, mission convention, okay, I must go and find out. And so I signed up, sent the payment, and then my family and I came. And what experience did you have there? So the experience was absolutely life-changing for me because I, I met people there um, so some of the speakers, like during the seminars, Pastor Conrad Vine, uh, he inspired everyone that came and listened to his talks. And uh, particularly uh, speaking um, spiritual warfare. Now, that's a battle that we are in. And um, the experience that he shared was quite uh, a revelation of how God works in different places all over the world, different countries. And sharing those experiences ignited in me to go to other places too. Did you attend any of the seminars? Yes, I did. I didn't miss any of the seminars. So it was, it was difficult because there were so many good uh, speakers there. And so you had to choose which one. So my favorite was Pastor Conrad Vine. I went to the others as well. But uh, I attended as many as I could. And tell me, what was your experience about the exhibition where all the little stalls and um, missionary projects were? What, what was your experience there? So I thought there was kind of like a mini ASI. And uh, um, it was quite uh, amazing to see how many people had uh, done a lot of good work at the stalls at the exhibition. And as I walked around and spoke to some of the people there, I just thought, wow, this is something that needs to be done. I was told it's like a once-off thing. And I said to you, please, this should be something we do every year. And now we're in trouble. <laughs> because we, we've organized another one in August next year. Praise the Lord. So, um, Madeleine, you was one of the people who was out by, by the Mission Convention. And uh, what was your understanding as uh, one of the people You know what? It was one of those most amazing places I could have been this year. If you missed it this year, make sure you're there next year in August. Mm. If you have any idea of what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. It means we are reaching people. You will be there because you have to be mission-minded to reach people. There I found others that were like-minded. You know, it was the first time it was held. I think people were a bit unsure about what this all was about. But I found people, you know, I actually felt like Elijah. You know, when he ran away into the desert and he thought, oh, he's the only one that's still standing. And you know, you come in, you go, wow, there's actually so many people that are like-minded. So if you're an Adventist that, have a heart, that has a heart for mission, I would suggest you already book your slot for August 2018. You cannot miss this. As Shift, we were there, we advertised, um, we got more people signed up to come and get part of, be, become part of the outreaches that we did. It was amazing. We networked like we hadn't before. You know, sometimes you think you have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to. Other Adventists have all their special niche places within the church. And that's where you find where they are and you start utilizing them. And you know what? God can use you in a much better way in your field. Brian, any motivation you want to give the audience? Yes, I would say if you want to be involved in mission, and we all should be, because uh, when we come in the church, we are to be missionaries, right? And uh, coming to the convention will broaden your scope, will widen your horizon, because you meet people who are already inspired by the Holy Spirit, that are on the mission field. 
And uh, you know what? We must be those who are hastening the coming of the Lord. And to be a missionary is not one who crosses the sea, it has been said, but one who sees the cross. And if you've seen your Savior on the cross, and you come to a place like Mission Convention, you will be inspired to do more for the Lord. Uh, I will not miss another one. And I thank God that Abundant Life and AFM were instrumental in doing that to bring that uh, mission convention to be what it was. And as uh, Abundant Life and AFM do this work here, support them. Because there's nothing more you can do in this life. Nothing better you can do in this life than to be a missionary for the Lord. Thank you very much. The mission convention is next year. It's in your, in your uh, programs. There's an advertisement for mission convention. You'll see it's next, next year in August in... Um, in the 9th, the weekend of the 9th, it's a long weekend, and the bookings will open in March next year. So um, please prepare yourself for the mission convention next year. Thank you very much. Kom ons staan saam vir ons thema lied. Let's all rise for our theme song. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning, allemaal. Geseende Sabbat. Ek wil net namens die KwaZulu Natal Vrijstaat Conferentie sê, baie dankie vir hierdie kampvergadering. We want to say thank you for this camp meeting. To the organizers and to those of you who faithfully support. And if it wasn't for this camp meeting, I wouldn't have had a wife. <laughs> so um, 19 years ago, when this camp meeting was still at Bethlehem, remember? Loch Athlone. Sabbath morning, 19 September 1998, at Morning Manor, I met Vilna. And uh, Amen. So come on, bid Psalm. Come on, bid Psalm. Jemelse Vader, ons wil vir jy baie dankie sê vir die prachtige Sabbadag. Jere, baie dankie vir jy liefde en jy goedheid en vir al die sieninge wat jy so mildelik op ons uitstoort. Lord, we want to praise you for who you are. We want to praise you for your goodness, for your love, your compassion, your forgiveness, and for being a God of new beginnings. And Lord, as we've gathered on this mountain, we want to pray for a revival deep down in our hearts. We pray that you will stir the innermost part of our being. And Heere, ons wil vraag dat ons hier sal weggaan met a nieuwe begeerte om u te dien, om vir u te werk. Heere, saam met Jeremia wil ons sê, maak ons gezond Heere, en ons sal gezond word. Verlos ons, en ons sal verlos word, want I is ons lof. Lord, I want to pray in a very special way for our speaker today. You have brought your servant John Baxter here for a special purpose. And Lord, as he will share what you have done in his life, I pray that our lives will be touched and changed. We want to pray that your spirit will move in this place and that through your grace, even from here, a harvest will come for you. And that we'll go out and bring in the greater harvest. Lord, we love you and we surrender our lives to you now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
worship His holy name. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. Like never before, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. I've been asked to do the scripture reading this morning. Um, it will be taken from two passages. The first one being Mark 5. Mark chapter 5, and I'll be reading from verses 2 to 8. Mark 5, starting at verse 2 through to 8. And when he was come out of the ship... Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And then the next passage will be in Luke 8, verses 38 to 40. Luke 8, verses 38 to 40. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine own house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way, and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all in waiting for him. Up to there. I really, truly, uh, a couple of perfunctories here before I share. Um, I truly want to thank God. Uh, I don't know how he timed this, but uh, today is the 30th anniversary of the story you're about to hear of when I met Jesus Christ, today. So I really praise God for that. I thank God for Fani. I also... Uh, Thank God for my wife. She was sitting back there. I don't know where she got to. Is she here? We will be celebrating 25 years of marriage next Tuesday. And I thank God for my wife. I also want to say bye bye donkeys to the ABL team at Abundant Life and AFM team. Really appreciate it. Mariette, I really appreciate your service. I wish I had understood what you were talking about up here. Um, Couple quick announcements. There is a, uh, I work with Adventist Frontier Missions in the United States. Uh, you have a team here in South Africa. I'm very grateful you do. Uh, we need to get as many laborers out as quickly as we can so we can hasten the coming of Jesus. I am praying some of you will consider that. There is a booth over here on this side of material uh, about the ministry of Adventist Frontier Missions taking the gospel to people who have never had a chance to hear before. I believe some of you are supposed to do that. If you have a genuine interest, not just you want to get some goodies, but if you have a genuine interest in being a missionary, I brought with me some USB cards. These are kind of cool little devices. They pop out like that. You can stick them in your wallet. This one has 52 uh, radio stories on it, mission stories. 
and then we have another one that has 16 videos on it. Please speak with either Hein or Daisy. They'll probably be back at the booth. If you genuinely have an interest in service. Um, if you don't have an interest in service, if, you, if you're not in a position to actually do that, please, please pray for our missionaries. Sign up, get the newsletter. It doesn't cost you anything, but since I said cost, please give money too. Yes, missionaries need funding. Um, okay, that's my uh, announcements. I'm going to share how Jesus Christ changed my life, and I pray that it's, he is uplifted and that uh, he will fulfill his promise, that you will be drawn to him. Um, we're going to have a time of silent prayer. This is what I do before I start. I invite you to bow your heads if you'd like to kneel, whatever is most comfortable for you, um, and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you this morning. Um, I mentioned yesterday morning, and I got this same uh, thought this, again this morning. If you're hungering for God, I believe he is here to fill you. If you're not hungering for God, he's still here to fill you. You just won't receive that blessing. So as we kneel, as we bow our heads, ask God to speak to you, to, to reach into your hearts and minds, to speak to those places that maybe you need some healing, uh, set free, and, and have the assurance that Jesus Christ loves you, he died for you, and he wants to give you eternal life. Okay, shall we pray? Amen. So the most famous verse in the Bible is John 3, 16. So I invite you to say it with me. You can say it in Afrikaans, in Zulu, in English, in whatever language is yours. But let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, now I want to change that a little bit. I'm not changing the Bible. You'll see why I'm doing this. Okay, I want to make it a little more personal. Okay, so, for God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son that if I would believe in him, I will not perish but have everlasting life. Can you say that? Can you believe that? I believe that's true. So, that was the only ver Bible verse I knew as a child growing up. Uh, we come from a typical middle, typical middle class American home. I have two brothers, an older brother and a younger brother. That makes me the middle child. How many middle children do we have here today? Yeah, that's right. You know what we're talking about. <clears throat> what a blessing. <sighs> And then my parents, when I was 12 years old, we adopted my sister who was three years old. And, um, and she had learning disabilities. And as a middle child who didn't feel like he was getting all the attention he needed, I couldn't understand why would my parents adopt this girl who's gonna take so much attention. And I actually uh, resented my sister for a long time. I am so thankful now that, that my parents, our family adopted my sister and I love her very much. She's been a great blessing in my life. Um, we come from a, a good nominal Christian home. You know what a nominal Christian is? In name only kind of thing? There are no such things. You can't be in name only a Christian. Not when you consider, seriously consider, God became a man, lived a perfect life, we nail him to a cross, and while we're nailing him to a cross, he's praying, forgive them. If you're nominal about that, nothing's going to excite you in life. But that's, that was our experience. We would go to church once a month. And of course, you don't miss Christmas and Easter. Um, the pastor at most of the churches, we went to a variety of different churches. The pastor would preach a sermon and he would talk. This is the book I read this week. And here's some sociology. Here's some politics. 
here's some current events, here's a couple bad jokes, have a good week. No Jesus. The only Jesus I heard about was this guy who was a felt cutout in Sunday school and they moved the picture around on the felt board. I didn't, when I went to church, I didn't meet anyone whose life had changed because they'd met Jesus Christ. Have you ever met anybody whose life has changed because they met Jesus Christ? You have today. <laughs> and I'm praying that tomorrow morning when you look in the mirror, you will say, I met another person whose life has changed. And it's you. Amen? So, um, the only time I remember as a child hearing the Holy Spirit speak to me was about 12 years old, and I was sitting about where Mika is. Is that you back there? Hi, Mika. And um, there were missionaries who came to the church, and I don't know how we ended up being at this service, because it was an afternoon service, but there were missionaries, and they talked about Jesus like he was a real person, and, and that he, it mattered if you believed in him, that, that he had the power to change your life. And I was a 12-year-old boy sitting in church crying, thinking, I want to be a missionary someday, God, please let me be a missionary. And my life got so screwed up, so unbelievably screwed up by the choices that I made. It is a miracle that God answered that prayer. But it wasn't until I realized who Jesus Christ is, that he is my personal savior, that God can answer that prayer. And I'd like to pray for you right now. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father, you know uh, the people who are sitting here. You know the private burdens that they carry, their joys, their hopes, their fears, their guilt. Will you come and fulfill your promise to send your spirit and minister to us through this story of how you've changed one simple sinner's life demonstrating your merciful loving kindness to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you're, I see the cameras aren't going to move on this, so you're going to miss this if you're watching this on YouTube or whatever it is. This is the only time I do this, this is the only sermon I do this, but I come down here and greet you, and I probably won't go all the way to the back, come chat to me later. <laughs> so I'll just go back here. Hi, I haven't met you before. What's your name? Gorswanabu. Say that again? Gorswanabu. I love you. <laughs> love you. Hi, you were here the other day. I love you. Nice to see you. Yeah. I love you, brother. Fred, right? That's right. Yeah, Fred. All right, good. Love you. Yeah, I better say that to your husband, too. I love you. <laughs> Another Fred. I love you, Fred. Hi, I love you. Thank you. I love you, too. Thank you. I love you. Yeah, you know what? I got to get on the other side of the room. So don't, don't think I don't love you. It's just I got to go to the other side of the room. Okay, actually, I don't. You got the point, right? So here's the question. Why is this stupid American running around going, I love you? It's because that's what you want to hear. Not from me, except my wife. I love you, Beth. You want to hear it from your spouse? You want to hear it from your kids. You want to hear it from your grandparents, your grandchildren. This is the only time I'm giving you permission to talk in church. If you're with your spouse today, just turn to them and say, I love you. If you're with your kids, tell them, I love you. Here's the challenge. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Don't tell everyone, I get to do that. If you don't tell them, someone else might. And that's a real problem. If your spouse or your kids or your grandkids or your grandparents aren't here, talk to me later. We'll get your cell phone. You can call them. Before the end, Sabbath ends today, call your kids up. Call your parents up and say, hey, I just want you to know I, I really do love you. Amen? More importantly, each one of us wants, really needs to know, believe that God loves us personally, individually, that he cares for us, that he forgives us, that we are his children. And I just want to tell you, if you doubt today that God loves you personally, if you don't have the assurance of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, today, look to the cross and ask God 
to forgive you for your sins and give you the confidence that because Jesus died on the cross, you have the hope of eternal life. Today, you can have that. If God can save me, he can save you, because he can save anybody. So, I grew up wondering if I was loved. And uh, maybe some of you feel that way. You're wondering, does anybody really love me? Um, and when you don't accept that you're loved, you start looking for substitutes, artificial substitutes for the real thing. And I'm gonna talk about the really bad ones here in a minute, but let's deal with the ones that society says are okay. So for example, um, television, the internet, video games, Advent is having a problem with food, our own self-righteousness, um, texting, WhatsApp, surfing, whatever it is, uh, and two that are too common in Adventism, worldly success and education. Now some of these things aren't bad, but when you use them to define who you are, instead of saying, I find my identity in being a child of God and, and, and a disciple of Jesus Christ, and those are the things that define you, you may want to talk to God about this because it could be a problem. Then there's the obvious things that we don't like to talk about, we don't like to admit we have, but they're there in some of our lives. You know, smoking, drinking, drugs, and when I say drugs, I'm talking street drugs, and maybe prescription medications, if you use that as a crutch, instead of allowing Jesus Christ to heal you. And pornography, I know there's no pornography in South Africa, I have to say that, because I'm from America. <laughs> right. So, we temporarily escape from our painful realities through these artificial substitutes, whether it's a DVD, uh, chatting on the internet, smoking pot, masturbating, whatever it is, because we have a problem. And we all have this problem, and it's called sin. And sin is ultimately going to destroy us unless we do something. Unless, unless you turn to, in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 55. Please turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 55, let's look at verses six and seven. Isaiah chapter 55, verses six and seven. And God says to you this morning, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. He will have mercy upon him. And to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Do you understand that God actually wants to show you mercy? He actually wants to forgive you. He doesn't want you running away and, and being afraid. He doesn't want you carrying your guilt and shame. He's taken that upon himself. Come to him so he can heal you. So, I tried most of those artificial substitutes and I found that they did not satisfy. And like many people in, in our culture, and I have to believe it's in your culture because this is the human condition, if you try these different things and they don't satisfy, then what you usually do is you go and you try to find love and acceptance in the affections of someone else, right? I used to say someone of the opposite sex. I can't say that anymore. In my situation, and I'm going to tell you, this sermon's going to get real heavy real fast here, okay? In my situation, the results were disastrous. Disastrous. Because by the time I was 15, I was a father. And before I turned 16, I was a murderer. There was a girl who lived next door, literally lived next door to me, and um, she got pregnant. We decided that the solution to the problem, and children are not a problem, was for her to have an abortion. Please hear me. In math, one plus one equals two. In biology, one plus one equals three or four or five. So if you're fooling around, and you're not married, stop. Because you think you can stop when it gets too close to being what you don't think you should do, and you can't. Just stop while you're ahead. And ladies and gentlemen, you have been given a gift, especially young people. I spoke to the youth yesterday, some young people here today. You've been given a gift. That gift is purity. Purity. Do you know what a blessing it is to present your spouse with that gift on your wedding night? I'm sorry to say 
at least in our culture, not very many people can do that anymore. It's a precious gift to be able to give. If you sacrifice your purity on the altar of sexual immorality, you will experience pain that will take a long time to heal. There is forgiveness and there is mercy, but you will have scars. You can be made new, but those scars are going to remain. So, if any of you fall into this temptation and you end up a father or a mother, and if you're a father, take responsibility for your own actions. But if you're a father or a mother, please save your child, save yourself. Someone will probably be happy to adopt your child if you can't care for it. Okay? And in a group this size, I don't know you, there's probably someone who's been through this torture experience. And I want you to know there is forgiveness. There is mercy. The most profound thought that I've experienced is this. God sent his son into this world, allowed us to put him to death so that we could be forgiven even for taking the life of our own children. God loves us. Look at the cross. He is willing to heal us, to forgive us. Trust him. A little deeper here, sorry. It'll lighten up a little bit. The impact of this experience caused me to lose interest in life. And so I tried to take my own life a couple of times. Thankfully, I was too much of a coward to succeed. Succeed. Right now, the number two cause of death amongst young people in, in North America is... Suicide. It has been replaced. It used to be number one. It's been replaced by texting and driving. No one in South Africa does that. <clears throat> Suicide, I think, is the number two cause of death amongst young people worldwide. You are in a position to change that. If you are a young person or if you're any age person. <coughs> Excuse me. And this thought enters your mind. Just passing thought ever enters your mind. Drop to your knees and pray. Cry out to God, God, I don't want to think this way. Please help me. He will help you. And then go talk to somebody. Talk to your parents. Talk to your pastor. Talk to your teacher. Talk to a friend. If you can't talk to pastor or parents, talk to somebody. They'll help you. That's one. The other side is, if you hear a young person or even an older person joking about this, commenting about this, Slap them in the face, give them a big hug and say, are you okay? If you watch young people, then their musical taste changed from delightful music like we've been enjoying here and now they're listening to Nirvana and Kurt Cobain and Pink Floyd and rock and roll music that brings people down. Pull them aside and say, are you okay? Can I help you? Do it privately. I shared this story at, at an Adventist Academy and all the children started crying because they just buried their friend and their friend had told them he was going to do it but nobody took him serious he could have been alive today I spoke at a church and a mother passed out because her son had just sucked on the end of a gun we can change this worldwide we can change this one life at a time young, I'm not looking at too many young people here Draw close to your young people. There are more temptations in the world for young people today than ever before. Draw close to them. If you see them straying, pull them back in, in love. So, um, yeah, I go on to college. I actually went to college. And, uh, but while I was there, I became a drug addict and an alcoholic because I was masking these feelings, the guilt and shame. I was taking booze and alcohol and, and drugs to, to hide my feelings and my shame and guilt. And so, anybody here study business? Anybody businessmen here? Somebody's got to be a bit. Yeah, a couple of people, okay? Supply and demand. You know, what the, you know how that works, right? So what do you think happens when the supply of drugs goes up? What does your demand for grades do? <laughs> yeah, it goes down. That's right, right. So, but of course you don't want to get bad grades. So what do you do? You cheat. Yeah, that's right. 60% of American students cheat. No one in South Africa cheats. 
At least not the Adventists. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh huh. So, let me tell you. You'll find out I actually became a banker and I was managing about, at this time, about $5 billion. And the Holy Spirit connect, uh, convicts me, hey John, you cheated in college. I cheated in four classes. So you need to send your diploma back. <laughs> yeah, right, okay, so I did. Pretty scary thinking I'm going to go from international banker to working at pick and pay. Nothing against pick and pay. <laughs> but no, ask me later, I'll tell you what happened. Um, so here's my one word sermon for those of you who are cheating. Stop! If you're cheating in class, if you're cheating on your spouse, if you're cheating on your taxes, if you're cheating, just stop. Okay, you're only cheating yourself, really. Just stop. Which brings me to my next point. When you do these things, whatever your sin problem is, and I don't need to know your sin problem, okay? He already knows it. If it's really big, or if it's just a little thing, or if it's really ugly black darkness, or it's just kind of moderately gray, you can't hide these things from God. You can fool some of the people some of the time. You can fool yourself most of the time. But you can't fool God. So why bother trying? When you're sitting there trying to persuade him that your sin is just a little thing, it's just a little thing, he says, oh really, look at the cross. Your mildly gray sin has caused the scarlet blood of my son to flow. And here's the amazing thing. He loves you. So while you're trying to persuade him it's not a big deal, he's saying, no, no, no. I'm going to take it away from you. I'm going to forgive you and then I'm going to give you the power so you don't have to do it again. And, and then he makes you a new person. So you don't have to hide behind this facade of church. Uh, how's, hey, happy Sabbath. How's it going? Yeah, happy Sabbath. When inside you're rotting away. He can heal you. He can heal you. So you don't have to be cool. You can like who you are. You can be made whole through the blood of Jesus. It's an amazing thing. Anyway, so I go to college. I put on a nice front. I actually looked like this in college, except a lot thinner. <clears throat> and uh, I got to be the senior class president at our college. And because of that, I met some important alumni, one of which happened to be the senior vice president of what is now known as J.P. Morgan Chase Manhattan Bank which I believe is the largest bank in the world, um, and from New York City. And I said, hey, I need a job. He said, come and interview. And anyway, long story short, I get this job in New York. Fantastic job. Uh, I go through their management training program. I'm making a lot of money for someone my age. And in this management training program, everyone is from Harvard and Yale and MIT and Stanford. You've heard of these places, right? Yeah, I went to Knox College. Everybody laughed at me. Well, I'm serious, all these snooty Ivy League people laughed at me, so I said, I'm going to work hard and I'm going to show them. And I did, and I got the highest grades of anybody in the program. And so when I got out, they actually changed my job so that I was put on uh, kind of sophisticated financial instruments, and my first loan at age 22 was $270 million for financing five cruise ships, including at the time the largest cruise ship in the world, the SS Norway. Within two years, I'm managing $2 billion at age 24. But I had a problem. I got a big hole in my heart. And I've been watching you. You have it too. It's eating us up from the inside. And we try to fill that hole with everything from veggie food, to pot, to porn, to education, to Alexis, to sex, to sports, to fill in the blank for whatever you try to put in that hole. And it's not until we taste and see that the Lord is good that we're really filled and satisfied. And there are some of you who, who at one time had an experience, a genuine experience with Jesus Christ, and now you're living on spiritual McNuggets. You know what McNuggets are? Those little things that McDonald's sells, those fake chicken things? You eat them and they kind of taste good, but they don't really satisfy. If, if your spiritual experience is you get up in the morning and say, God, please help me today, you read a text and then you run away, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You're doing what you think is necessary to get by, but that's not a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's calling you to be his friend, to love him, to spend time with him. Today he may be calling you anew 
to taste and see that you can be refreshed and filled and healed. Anyway, so I'm working for the bank and um, they treated me really well. I worked very hard, but they sent me to Columbia University, uh, New York City, uh, Ivy League school, thank you. Um, for, and they gave me the summer off, so I got three months off, and they paid my salary during that time, and they paid for my MBA. Really good program. So now I had two apartments in New York City. I don't know how well you know New York, but it's made up of five different places. The main part of New York is Manhattan. And then I had an apartment in Queens in a nice little community, suburban community. And then I had an apartment up by Columbia University in Manhattan. And um, don't try this. I was not a Christian when I did this, okay? My girlfriend was living with me at the apartment in Queens. We had been dating for three years in college and now for the fourth year. This is not my wife, by the way. Uh, you'll find out. Um, anyway, we, we were living together in Queens and then when I got this... Uh, MBA program, I took an apartment up by Columbia. So in the middle of the week, I would be up in Manhattan. And then on the weekends, I would come back to Queens and we would be together. Well, we'd been dating for four years. I was about to ask her to marry me. I decided I would surprise her, come home in the middle of the week, take her out for dinner, just to spend some time with her. And she surprised me. There is another man. And I was devastated. I went into this slow descent into mental torment. I stopped eating for two months. I was wondering, could I ever be loved? Here, the woman who I thought loved me, I, gone. Um, I did not accept that my parents loved me. I knew nothing of the love of God. I didn't, I didn't forget about loving myself. I didn't like who I was. Some of you may feel that way today. Do you know that God loves you? Just who you are, he loves you, he's glad you're his child. Because when you know that, you can actually like who you are. You can be whole in Jesus Christ. We live in a world of broken relationships and broken lives. This is a really good, beautiful place here. Thank you for having the camp meeting here. I watch the fog just melt away as the sun shines on it. That's sort of like our dreams in life. You know, when you're young, you have these great dreams and then you wake up one morning and go, where did my dreams go? They just dissipated like the fog. Please hear me. There is a love, and we're all searching for this. There is a love that is better than any human being can ever fulfill. And I want to ask, who's been married the longest here? Keith, because I knew your name, I pick on you. How long have you been married? Fifty-five years. Look at that. Praise the Lord. Yeah, that's all right. That's good. Okay, now I, I didn't set this up with him. So Keith, does your wife meet all your needs? She does. That's the wrong answer, Keith. Let's find someone else. <laughs> that's why he's been married 55 years. Sorry. I should have set it up. Um, the reality is, and I appreciate that you have a good marriage, the reality is your wife can't meet certain needs in your heart. You can't fulfill needs in her heart. We weren't built that way. God didn't design us that way. We have certain needs that are supposed to be met by our spouses, but there are needs that are supposed to be met by God and by, only by God. And until, until we realize that and accept that, we're going to be searching for something to fulfill that, that need. And I hope you can stay married for 55 years. Anyway, so what do you do? If you don't know this thing, well, if you're living in 21st century South Africa or America, and I don't know, maybe it's not so common here, we buy things. Do you know that here in South Africa? You go out and buy things to satisfy that need? Okay, well, I thought, you know what? If I buy something for my parents, they're going to love me. Now, I, I now know my parents loved me at that time, but I didn't accept it. So I saw a house um, advertised in the New York Times newspaper and I said, I'm going to buy my parents a house. Which at this point most parents are saying, could you adopt me? <laughs> anyway, buying things doesn't cause people to love you. Only by love is love awakened. So today, if you sense that the Holy Spirit is causing you to, to want to know this Jesus and to be filled with his love, he wants to help you to know that it's true. 
Anyway, so I, I, I called about this house and I said, I'm going to come down and see it. And I rented a car from the uh, airport, went over, got the car. I rolled up a bar bunch of joints, marijuana cigarettes. Marijuana is illegal in South Africa, right? You're not supposed to smoke this? Yeah, so anyway, I rolled up a bunch of joints. I had a carton of cigarettes. I smoked three packs of cigarettes a day, drank 10 cups of coffee, and I drove from New York City down to Pennsylvania, which was about four or five hours. And um, I was high on pot and wired on coffee, and I, it's foggy night, it's about two o'clock in the morning, and I drive past the cemetery, St. Agnes's Cemetery. It's a Catholic cemetery. The girl who I'd been dating, who I thought I was gonna marry, was Catholic. And there was this life-size crucifix there in the graveyard, all lit up. And in my strange mind, I said, I need to go pray in the graveyard. Now, don't do this, okay? Please hear me. I'm telling you straight out, don't do this. Because a crucifix is an idol, and I now understand God says don't worship idols. And you risk unimaginable pain if you do this, which you're about to hear. But I didn't know that. So I went to this graveyard, and I went to this cross, and I bowed down in front of Jesus, and I said, what I thought was Jesus, okay? It's not Jesus. And I couldn't face him, so I went around to the back of the cross, and I prayed. And I said, God, my life is a mess. Please help me. If you think your life is a mess today, you don't have to go to an idol. You can cry out today, right now, from your heart, and the God of heaven will hear you. He will forgive you. He will heal you, and he will guide you. Anyway, I, I, uh, I wandered around in the graveyard for a while, and then I took my sleeping bag out, I put it in front of the crucifix, and I laid down and went to sleep in this graveyard. Do not try this at home. In the middle of the night, and I don't know what time it was, I was sleeping, I had this very vivid dream. These dark clouds are rolling, and uh, there's a storm going on, and then the clouds part, and a light shines down, and it shines on me, and this voice says, the end of the world is coming, and you will have a part in it. I went back to sleep pretty soon, Somebody's shaking me, and I look up, and there's two police officers. What are you doing here? Uh, I said, um, do you believe in God? They said, yeah. I said, well, God told me to be here last night. They said, well, okay, get out of here and don't do it again. I said, no, <laughs> no, I won't. So I grabbed my boots, which have about 20 joints in them, marijuana cigarettes, in my boots. I get my sleeping bag. And I run and I throw them in the car and I've got to start the car up and drive away. Um, but I've got a problem. Uh, everything that is light is purple. Everything that is dark is black. And I've got voices in my head telling me all kinds of nasty things. Because the accumulation of my wicked behavior, I finally crossed that line. And that night in the graveyard, I became demon possessed. And the demons were relentless in their torment. I, I've got to drive, you know, because the police are waiting for me. They're screaming all kinds of terrible lies. I don't repeat what the demons say. Suffice it to say they wanted me dead. And I'm driving down the highway 70 miles an hour, just crying and screaming. And I turn the radio on to try to find some peace. I listen to rock music, satanic messages coming through those songs. Yes, there are satanic messages in those rock songs. Don't listen to them, okay? I just... I put the cruise control on at 70 miles an hour. I curl up in the fetal position in the front of the car, just crying. Car keeps on driving. My angel knows how to drive. Yours might not. Don't try that. <laughs> really. Some people are like, wow, man, I'm going to try that. Don't try that. So, miraculously, I make it back to New York City. I go to work on Monday morning. I'm looking for a sign from God. Looking for a sign from God. What is going on? I have no idea. I do a whole bunch of weirdly weird things, and then I come home Monday night and I watch a football game. You know what American football is, right? At major sporting events in, uh, in the United States, there's two guys who travel around the country, and they hold up these big yellow signs wherever the goal posts are, the, the posts for the soccer match, or the, you know, I don't know what you do in rugby. Um, but they hold up these signs that say John 3:16, and I knew that, so I'm watching this game looking for that sign looking for that sign, and there it is, Matt 4.4. 4. I had no idea what that meant, so I went to my Bible, I got it off the shelf, dusted it off, 
Looked up Matt, Matthew 4.4. 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In my mind, that was my sign from God. If you're looking for a sign from God, here it is. You're sitting here today, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And he is saying, yes, this is me. Please, please give your heart to me. That's the sign you're looking for. I didn't understand that. I went to work the next day at the bank. I walked into my boss's office and I said, I quit. Well, I said a whole bunch of other weird stuff. I quit. God's told me the end of the world is coming. I've got to go tell people. And he was very patient with me, very gracious. I'm managing $5 billion for them right then. And uh, I wandered around New York City all, all, almost all night long. About 2 o'clock in the morning, I went back to my apartment and I'm just freaking out. And I called my mother. Now, my mother lives in Chicago. That's like between here and... Cape Town twice. I live in New York. My mother lives in Chicago. Two o'clock in the morning. This is the call no mother wants to get. Call her up. Mom, I need you to come now. She's, what, what's wrong, son? I don't know. I just need you to come now. Okay, I'll be there. My mom was, that was two in the morning. My mom was in New York by eight o'clock in the morning. She, she just threw things in a bag, drove to the airport, and, and asked, when's your next flight? I got to get to New York now. She didn't call her boss anything. She just came. When I was 15 and um, my next door neighbor and I uh, had a child or were going to have a child and decided not to, my mother told me something. She said, son, in your lifetime, if you have two people you can call day or night, anytime, and say, I need you to come now, and they will come no questions asked. If you have two people in your lifetime, you have had a blessed life. Who would you call? Think about it. Who would you call? And let that person know how much you appreciate them. And then the other question is, who would you do that for? Who would you drop everything for? Just go to the airport, get on an airplane. Tell that person, those people, that you love them that much. We need to hear that. My mom comes, she calls my boss. What's going on with my son? They said, we're not sure, but we have a, we have a uh, reservation for him at the New York University Psychiatric Hospital. So I get admitted to the Looney Tune boom, you know. I listen to what they say, they medicate me heavily. I listen to what they say, I figure out what I think they want me to say and I tell them and they let me out. Listen, you can fake it with people. You can't fake it with God. Don't be a phony Christian. Really? The world is waiting, crying, sighing, dying for us to be real Christians. Put away the sin. Put on the armor of God. Amen? So I get out of, out of this uh, mental institution and I go back to work. My mother goes back to Chicago. I still, at this point, I thought that the voices in my head were from God. And the medication turned the volume down. So I stopped taking that medication. I started smoking pot again. Guess what the demon started doing? Roaring loudly in my brain. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I go, um, one night I go wandering around. I go back to my apartment. And I think if I go back to that cemetery and pray, maybe this will go away. So I call for a rental car at the airport again. I call for a taxi to take me to the airport. The taxi comes. I'm so scared, I can't get off the couch. I'm just petrified with fear. Three times I call a cab. Three times I'm too afraid to get off the couch. Are you afraid? Are you afraid of the future? Lots of Advents are afraid of the future. You don't have to be afraid. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a, a sound mind. So, I never got in the cab. I just decided, okay, I'm going to walk to the airport to pick up this rental car. And now it's, I don't know, 11, 1 o'clock in the morning. It's pouring rain. I don't care. I've got about a seven or eight mile walk. I'm just walking in the rain in the middle of the night. I get to a place in New York City that had, they had the World's Fair in 1962. It's, and, and they had a sculpture of a globe of the world. And it was about three times as high as this 
as this building, as this ceiling right here. So huge sculpture. And now it's starting to dawn, and I grab this sculpture, and I start scre screaming, the world's not fair. You know, because this is from the World's Fairground. The world's not fair. Do you realize the world is not fair? Let me, let me tell you, if you haven't figured that one out yet, the world's not fair. This may surprise you. God is not fair either. If God was fair, we'd be dead. God is merciful. God is merciful. He's better than you realize. He's so merciful. I said, okay, I'm not going to go to the, uh, the graveyard. I'm just going to do what the voices in my head are, are telling me to do. So I go back to my apartment and I say, how am I supposed to tell people the end of the world is coming? I have no idea what I'm doing. I got voices in my head telling me this. So I remember from Sunday school in those little felt cutouts, the prophets always wore robes. Yes, you can laugh, it's okay. <laughs> this is funny. I'm not dead. So I take off my clothes, I put on my bathrobe. I don't have any shoes on, it's snowing outside. I get my Bible, which of course I'd never read before in my life, and I'm going to go to Rockefeller Center, which is like the center of Midtown Manhattan, New York City, and start screaming, the end of the world is coming! So I start walking down the busiest road in Queens, going to Manhattan, on the yellow line, cars are blowing by me, nobody says anything. I get to the bridge that connects Queens with Manhattan, now people are saying things that you don't say in church. And there's a guy on the outside lane who stops his car and he says, hey, would you like a ride? And I look over and it's a stretch limousine. And I said, limo, going in style. Okay, yeah, thank you. So he says, come sit up here, come sit up front with me. So I do, I get in. He said, where are you going? I said, Rockefeller Center. He said, oh, what are you doing? I said, well, I had this dream. God told me the end of the world is coming and I've got to go tell people. He said, oh, I think you're right. I think the end of the world is coming and I think God wants you to tell people. But I'm not sure if this is the way he wants you to do it. He said, what do you got there? I said, it's a Bible. He said, have you ever read the Bible? I said, no. Have you ever read the Bible? Think about it. I said, no, I have never read the Bible. He said, why don't you do this? Why don't you go home, read the Bible, find out how Jesus told people the end of the world is coming, and then go do it the way Jesus did. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. He said, what do you do, son? I, I, I'm an international banker, but I'm not really happy. He said, well, here, here's my card. My name's Sonny Goodson. I got 12 guys working for me. I want you to go home. I want you to read the Bible. And when you're done reading the Bible, give me a call. I want you to come work for me. Drive a limo. Cool. Okay, thank you. So we get to about 63rd Street, and uh, he starts, he lets me off. He drives away. I start walking back to the bridge and the bridge is at 59th Street, and I'm starting thinking about this guy and this whole thing. This was so bizarre. His name was, what was his name? Anybody remember? Sonny Goodson. The good son has 12 guys working for him. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What good son had 12 guys working for him? That's right, Jesus. You don't have to be psychotic to get this. <laughs> so now I'm thinking, Jesus wants me to come work for him. Wow. So now I'm on the railing of the bridge. Jesus wants me to come work for him. Whoa. And, and a car pulls up, and the voice says, hey, John, come on, I'll give you a ride home. Same guy going the other way. Let me assure you, people in New York City do not pick up people in bathrobes regularly. <laughs> Certainly not twice on the same bridge going opposite ways. I have not been able to find him on Google or anywhere else. But we're going to have a good time when we get to heaven. Anyway, um, I get back to my apartment. There's 12 New York City policemen waiting to put me in a straitjacket and escort me to a, another psychiatric hospital. Thankfully, a friend of mine comes with me. They let me out under his supervision, provided I fly to Chicago to be admitted to another psych hospital there. I get to, ho get to my parents' house. I've got one day at home before they put me in a psych hospital. My parents decide, let's watch a movie. So they watched a horror film. And the demons are just screaming. Seriously, folks, really. Think about what you put in your brains. By beholding you become, yeah, think about it, okay? Let's just invite those guys into our brains. While I'm screaming because of the horror and terror that I'm witnessing, my sister, 
the one who I really didn't care for, now she's 14 years old. She takes me in her arms, she starts stroking my head. It's okay, John. I love you. You're going to be okay. I wanted to heal because my sister loved me. Tell them you love them. Show them you love them. Amen? Turn off the Xbox. Stop being workaholics. Get out of the mall. Turn off the, we have Netflix, you had what? Something DVS, DSTV. Stop the chatting. Pick up the Bible. Pick up your Bible right now. Let's go to John chapter 5. So while I'm in the hospital, I started to do something that Sonny Goodson told me to do. I started to read this book. It's an amazing book. I really encourage you to read it. John chapter 5, let's look at verses 39 and 40. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Yet you will not come to me that you might have life. Read the Bible and come to Jesus. You will experience, I'm thankful to say, abundant life. A life that is so much better than just grounding through each day. You can have joy and peace and healing in places where you don't even know you need healing yet. Have you ever had God talk to you? I'm not talking about the voices in my head. I'm talking about through his word. He comforts us. He encourages us. It's amazing. I, I love God. I love Jesus Christ. Anyway, I'm going through a counselor, and uh, I've got a psychiatrist and a psychologist. I'm talking to these guys. And I said, so, so when do I get healed? And the guy said, uh, you're on medication the rest of your life. And I said, eh, wrong answer. Sorry. So I went to another psychologist, and he said, oh, that, I think you've got the wrong diagnosis and the wrong medication. I said, I thought so. I'll be back. So I went to a third guy. I said, uh, different diagnosis, different medication. I said, yeah, um, here's the deal. I don't want to be a pharmacological guinea pig. I have nothing against the mental health profession. I believe people who are in that profession are doing the best that they can. And I believe the medication they gave me slowed down my mind and lowered the volumes of the demons enough for me to be able to perceive the Holy Spirit. Having said that, I don't believe that a pill, a bottle, or someone else's body can heal you. Only Jesus Christ can heal you. Amen? So I start reading my Bible because my life depends upon it. Your life depends upon what's in this book. Really, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Anyway, I'm searching for healing, trying everything. I'm going to different churches. I'm going to synagogues. I'm going to New Age meetings. Whatever I could do to find healing. I meet this guy who makes this really beautiful furniture. And I think, hey, maybe if I become a carpenter like Jesus, I'll be healed. So I said, can I come and interview at your place? He said, sure. So this is down in Virginia. I take a vacation from the bank. I go down to Virginia. I interview with a guy. I don't get the job, not surprisingly. And, um, but I am desperate for healing. I am longing to be made whole. Are you desperate for healing? Are you longing that Jesus Christ would make you whole so that you can say with confidence, I'm forgiven, I'm healed, I will be in heaven because of what Jesus has done for me? He brought you here today for that reason. I, I, I was camping when I went for this interview up in the mountains and my camera was broken. I'm not real swift. The batteries were in upside down. So I took it to a camera shop. The guy turned the batteries around. He said, your camera's fine. In the window of the camera shop, there was a poster and it said, come and find out about the amazing facts of what the Bible says about the end of the world. And I said, well, maybe that's why I'm here. So I see where the meetings are. I go up, I meet this young man at the door named Danny. He said, hey, nice to meet you. I've been praying for you. I was like, you've been praying for me? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was praying one more person would come, and you showed up. And I said, oh, thanks. He said, come on in. So he takes me inside. He meets, I meet all these nice, you know, clean-cut, shining faces like the youth I saw yesterday, young people. And, and then they had this meeting, and this, you know, just cherubic-looking young lady gets up there and plays the violin. I'm used to listening to rock and roll, and she's like, Roo. 
Beautiful, just incredible. Then they have this health talk. Wow, I never knew that. Fantastic stuff. And then this guy gets up and he preaches from the Bible about Jesus. And you know, the, the, the Bible to me is like a big puzzle. You got a piece over here, you got a piece over here, you got a piece over here, and if you put all those pieces together, you get a picture of the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Okay? Read it again, and what happens is the pieces get smaller. And as the pieces get smaller, because you understand the details a little better, it gets more beautiful, it gets more subtle, it gets more nuanced. It's, it's, but you still see Jesus, Savior of the world. It's incredible. So, um, anyway, so this guy's preaching. I'm starting to get it because by now I've read the Bible through twice, even though I was smoking pot and drinking alcohol while I was reading it. There are people out there who are really searching. Give them a chance. Anyway, first meeting was Friday night, then Saturday night. No meeting Sunday. Monday night there was a meeting. I'm, I'm on the vacation from the bank for a couple of weeks. And uh, after the meeting Monday, he says, John, you want to come over and have lunch with us and we'll have a Bible study? I said, sure. He said, okay, why don't you come over Wednesday afternoon? So I go over to their house for uh, uh, lunch and it was vegetarian food. <laughs> have you ever had vegetarian food? <laughs> really? This lady was a phenomenal cook. Phenomenal. She's actually written three cookbooks. So here's my little tip from all of us from the outside coming in. If you're going to cook vegetarian food for your guests, which I encourage you to do, introduce them to a healthier lifestyle, make sure it's good. Don't serve leftover eggplant. I have to put that in there because I've had leftover eggplant. Fantastic lunch. Dessert was better. Better. So good. So delicious. So sweet. So filling. He just showed me Jesus. He showed me the Savior of the world. We get through our Bible study and he said, John, well let me share you a couple of texts. You probably are familiar with some of these. He said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift. And then he said that one that we started with. God so loved the world. He loved you. He loved John. Even John. He loved you and me so much. He gave his only son that if we will believe in him, we're not going to perish. We'll have eternal life. Wow. And then this man, his name was Jim, he asked me, he said, John, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, really? And I'm asking you the same question this morning. Have you ever really accepted Jesus as your Savior? And I said to Jim, I said, Jim, um, you know, I've seen those guys on television talking about that. What does that mean to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? He said, well, John, you asked me three questions. I'm going to ask you the same questions. He said, do you believe, based on what you read in the Bible, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I said, yes. Do you believe that? Second question. And he didn't know me. I don't know you. So I don't know how you want to answer this, but I knew I had a real serious problem. He asked me, do you realize you're a sinner? Yes. And then he asked me the third question, and this is for me the most important one. Do you want to be forgiven, and do you want to be healed? And I, I almost reached out and grabbed, yes, I want to be forgiven, and I want to be healed. Please. He said, well, let's pray. Let's ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. So we prayed a very simple prayer. Dear God, I come to you asking you to forgive me. I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he came as a man. He died on the cross for me. I want to be forgiven. I want to be healed. Please be my savior. In Jesus' name, amen. That was on Wednesday afternoon. There was a meeting that night. Again, sweet message, sweet people, wonderful. Thursday, there's no meeting. Friday night is the last meeting that I'm going to be able to attend because I'm on vacation and I'm going to go home. So at the end of the meeting, um, Jim has a prayer. He said, let's come all, all come down front and tell God what we're thankful for. And so everybody goes down front. I'm going to go down front. And he said, let's pray. God, we thank you for being able to worship freely. We thank you that we have jobs. Thank you that we don't smoke cigarettes anymore. Thank you for our families. Thank you. Did you hear that? 
He said, thank you, we don't smoke cigarettes anymore. This is Friday night. Friday night, Friday all day, Thursday all day, Wednesday. From the time I asked Jesus Christ to be my savior, for three days, I didn't smoke a cigarette. I smoked 60 cigarettes a day. And I didn't know I hadn't had a cigarette. And then I realized, hey, I haven't smoked any pot in the past three days. And then I realized, I don't have any demons anymore. I'm free. Jesus Christ set me free with one simple prayer. I'm free. Do you know how good it is to be free? Oh, I'm forgiven. I'm healed. Wow, wow. It's just amazing. Fred has been talking, and the theme of his message is, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. You can be free. Jesus is better than you've heard. He's better than we deserve. Anyway, I go back to work at the bank. Lady I work with, she walks up to me, she says, what happened to you? I said, what do you mean? She said, your face, your face is glowing. You look like Moses come down from the mountain with God. I said, yeah, I accepted Jesus and he set me free. Now these people have watched me chain smoke. I said, yeah. She said, I can see it, your face is glowing. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. It's true. It's true, you can have that experience today. You can have that experience today. You can be forgiven, you can be healed. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, I wanna encourage you to do that today. If you accepted Jesus but you've been wandering around and, and, and you wanna recommit your life to him today, I wanna encourage you to do that. And I need to tell you this, the end of the world is coming. If you don't know Jesus, that's pretty scary. But if you know Jesus, that's good news. And I don't know how it is with you, but I wanna urge you to accept Christ today. You might be fearful, you might have guilt, you might have shame, just come and ask Jesus to come into your heart. I'm gonna actually come down here and kneel. I'm not asking anybody to play any music. I just want you to, if, if you don't want to come down front, that's fine. Sit there and pray silently that others who need to accept Jesus Christ will come and join us, okay? I'm gonna ask you to do that, and then when I'm done with that, I'm gonna come back up here and ask for something else. So if you want to accept Christ as your savior, maybe for the first time, maybe it's been a long time since you've done it, and you say, I want to recommit myself to Jesus, please come and join me, and let's just pray silently. Please join us. Dear Father, I want to thank you that we have a Savior. That no matter how low we've fallen or how good we think we are, we have a Savior. Please forgive us and heal us and make us new. Thank you for your merciful loving kindness. Please send Jesus soon. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. The other thing I want to ask you to do, and this grows out of um, Michaela's grandmother's testimony, if you have someone in your family who is not walking with Jesus, and, um, and you've been pleading with him, to draw them afresh, or to draw them for the first time, I'd like to invite you to stand, and just, we're gonna pray for your family members, okay? Probably most of you have somebody. Um,
And I'll just say this, if um, I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk with me, I'm here today, gone on Monday, but I would love to pray with you, talk with you. Um, this particular sermon is on YouTube. I also, I preached this before, um, I brought CDs with me. They're on the back table where the uh, AFM materials are. If you want a copy, take one. Please only take one so that others might have an opportunity to take one as well. Okay. Let's pray. Dear God, you are our Father. Our Father. And we are standing as fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters. We're standing for our, our children. Maybe our grandchildren. Maybe our brothers and sisters. Those that have walked away from you. Those that have never known you. God, please. Please, you have said in your word that you would contend with him who contends with us and you would save our children. We ask you to do that. Cause them to hate sin, whatever their folly is at this time. Draw them back to the purity and simplicity of your love. May they know you are, you are a wonderful Savior. Thank you, God. Thank you for hearing and answering that even right now, you are working in their hearts and minds and lives to draw them to yourself. Thank you for working in our lives to draw us to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.